turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. The title of the message is Jesus Has Returned. Thank you. That's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. I'm like, that was, that was a pretty long, long pause. Like, Jesus has returned, and you guys are, that's like deserving of, yeah, he has returned. I'm not sure about you, but we look around at this thing called life, and sometimes we're like, man, Jesus, this, this is about time, right? It's about time for you to return, because we, we look around at what's going on in our world, and if we're not careful, we're going to watch the news and it'll just be a head down. You're done watching the news. You go outside. And how many of you get like halfway or all the way to the, to the front of a grocery store door and go, man, I forgot my mask in my car that's in like the north. One. Like, ah! I mean, so many things that are going on in, in life today where, you know, there's fear going on. And, and if we're not careful, family, we're going to be kind of sucked into, into all of that. But as we keep our, 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 our faces in, in, in the Bible. I'm not sure about you, but there's, there's sometimes when, I, when I'm reading my scriptures and I'm going, yeah, Lord, this is exactly what I needed to hear. To, to, to hear that the Lord is, is on the throne. And this morning, we've been singing some great songs. Great is thy faithfulness. Let me tell you, we don't sing those songs to remind God that he's faithful, right? <laughs> we sing the songs to, to remind us that God is is faithful. And you notice that the, the lyrics didn't say, okay, is his faithfulness, right? It says, great is his faithfulness. And as you and I are, are living and we're keeping our, our faces in God's word, when we hear about the return of Christ, it should bring some type of, yeah, everything is gonna work out. It should bring, be some type of, although we're going through a bunch of stuff right now on this planet, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is, is coming back. When I think about Jesus coming back, I don't think about, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jesus, I have this to do and that to do. I'm like, Let, let's go. <laughs> but the train is ready, waiting for you. The passengers are, are loaded. And what's beautiful about Jesus coming back, it just, it just brings, it should bring us this, this hope and this, this peace and this joy that, that God's got a plan, that we're not just here just going like this, you know, throughout, the, throughout life, that God has a plan and a purpose, and, and one day he's going to call us home, um, or he'll come for us. But if he calls us home, that just simply means that the plan and the purpose that he had for us, the assignment, is done. And when our assignment's done, we're going to see Jesus, and that, again, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Charles Spurgeon says it like this, the sound of his approach should be as music to our hearts. When you think of Jesus coming again, I hope you get so excited. You're thinking, yeah, that our Lord and Savior is going to come to this world a second time. Well, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 11 through 16. And when you get there, give me an amen. amen. Good job, everybody. Revelation chapter 19, starting at verse 11, it says this. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. What's the name, family? King. King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Amen and amen. Let me give you a couple of uh, fun facts when it, uh, regarding the second coming 
of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be what we call a fulfilled prophecy. The second coming of Jesus Christ is mentioned over 18 time, 1,800 times in the Old Testament and over 300 times in the New Testament. It's referred to in 27 Old Testament books and 23 New Testament books. In the New Testament, one out of every 25 verses refers to the second coming of Christ. For every prophecy on the first coming of Christ, there are eight prophecies on the second coming of Christ. And this is from George Sweeting's book, Who Said That? I also found out this week was very interesting. Did you know the second coming of Christ was mentioned in the book of Genesis? Let that marinate for a second. So the second coming of Christ actually mentions, was the second coming of Christ being mentioned predates the flood. You might be going, how do you know that? Because the Bible says, check this out in Jude uh, verse 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, quote, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Jude is letting us know that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about the second coming of Jesus. I read that and I'm going, how cool is the Bible? How great is that? Well, on to our text this morning. If you're taking some notes, our first point this morning is Jesus is faithful and true. Jesus is faithful and true. The Bible says, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. There are times when you and I are very faithful and there's times when we struggle to be faithful. Maybe you're one of the people that'll say, hey, I'll be at your house at two o'clock. And that really means 2.30, right? We know people like that. We, we desire to be faithful, but somehow we fall a little short of being faithful. But what's beautiful about Jesus is that he is always faithful, that we can trust Jesus. Uh, most of you, when you came into the sanctuary this morning, you didn't take the chair you're going to sit on. You didn't lift it up and give it a little shake. You didn't make sure all the screws are in. You didn't put your foot on it. You didn't toss it up. You just, and you sat down. You believed that the chair will be able to hold you up. You believe the chair would be faithful enough to, to keep all of the capacity, right? Now, what's beautiful is that Jesus has always been faithful, and he has always been true. Now, you might be thinking, well, pastor man, well, why did this happen in my life, and why did that happen in my life? Just because God allows things to happen in our lives doesn't mean that he is not faithful. Psalm 23 says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, and your rod and your staff comfort me. So although we go through a little something, something, that doesn't mean that God is not faithful. He is faithful to walk with us. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. They're not exhaustive, but regarding Jesus' faithfulness. First John 1 John 1.9, we learn that Jesus is faithful to forgive sin. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is faithful to love, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Good job, everybody. Jesus is faithful to renew and restore. We have 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become brand new. Jesus is faithful to keep his word, John 14. He says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then let me give you this one more. Jesus is faithful to judge sin. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, it says, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him 
from the dead. Jesus is faithful and Jesus is true. And you and I can trust in Jesus's faithfulness. How do we know? Hebrews 13 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know how we've been getting a little older, how styles change. Some of you, I was going to say, some of you have afros, but probably not. Uh, some of you had some, some, some bell bottoms. You know, some of you had certain type of clothing. When I was growing up, it was Michael Jackson jacket <laughs> and a glove. I had the jerry curl, the glove, and the jacket and the poster. Woo-hoo. But then as time changed, a, a new fad came in, right? And that's what the world does. The world just kind of keeps changing with the times. But what's beautiful about Jesus is he doesn't change. The Bible says he is the same yesterday, yesterday, and what? Forever. That he's, he's consistent. So that means Jesus is not going to say, man, you just keep messing up. You know what? No more love for you. No. He's consistent. He consistently loves, consistently saves, consistently renews, consistently restores because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything that we see today in our, in our world, it's, it's in a state of flux. It's, it's completely, it's always changing. What, what really remains the same? Really nothing. But Jesus here remains the same. This is why it's important, family, that we go through the Bible chapter by chapter, book by book, verse by verse, so that we'll, we'll know all about God, not just a little bit about God. And Jesus not changing is just a wonderful thing. Verse 11, it says, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. We're talking about Jesus. I have a picture of him in my house and he's carrying a little lamb and there's lambs all around him. He's got his little stick and he's looking all handsome. He's making war and he's judging people. Yeah. Again, that's why we need to read the whole entire Bible. We don't want to just hang out that Jesus is love in the Corinthians chapter. No, we want to, we want to know everything that God wants us to know that he judges and he makes war. Now you might be thinking, well, pastor, man, that's a little aggressive. Why is Jesus judging people? Jesus is obligated to judge all sin. All sin has to be accounted for. If we were to retrace our steps, uh, the people of the world have heard about the cross. Some have seen the cross. They've seen Jesus. They've heard Jesus. They've had the the scriptures. They've had the disciples. They've had the, the, the holy writing, and they still have said no to Jesus. So when these individuals die, they're going to stand before their maker to be accountable for, for their sin. In the book of Revelation, we've heard the 144,000 uh, Jewish evangelists are going to go out and evangelize the world. We had God's two witnesses. We had an angel flying throughout the world to all tribes, tongues, and nations giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. We had stones falling from the sky. We have uh, seas turned into blood. We had the destruction of Babylon. And the majority of the world said, yeah, I don't want this whole Jesus guy. Not only did they say, I don't want Jesus, but give me the mark of 666 on my, my forehead or on my hand that I might buy, sell, and trade. Now we're thinking, wait a minute. Jesus offers forgiveness of our sins, eternal life, hope, peace, and joy now and to come. And the world says, yeah, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Well, God says, okay, but one day everyone's going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You and I that are believers, it's the Bema seat, but we're all going to stand before God. And what are we going to say? Ooh, I didn't know that all this thing, this Jesus thing was true. So when we reject what God has given us, then you and I stand before God on our own. And I tell you what, uh, when we stand before God, no excuses are going to work. But why would we say no to Jesus? Why would we say, you know, I'm this not, I'm not, yeah, Jesus, I am, I'm not sure if you're really real. These are some of the thoughts that are going on today. God will judge all sin. Commentator Mount says it like this, any view of God which eliminates judgment and his hatred of sin in the interest of an emasculated doctrine of sentimental affection finds no support in the strong and virile realism of the apocalypse. Uh, many churches don't talk about sin and God judging sin because unfortunately some pastors think, well, we talk about sin, no one's going to come to church. Oh, no, 
No one's going to come to church because they're going to be called sinners, stinking sinners. Oh, if no one comes to church, then how are we going to pay our bills? I mean, God forbid we wouldn't teach what the scriptures say because we're afraid of no one come. Really? If two of you come, you're getting some Jesus. It was just me and my wife. She's getting some Jesus. Everybody gets Jesus. And God forbid that we wouldn't preach this glorious gospel that, that God does hate sin. Now, when we think about sin today, we're like, well, it's kind of just a, a white lie. Well, Jesus would call that sin. And the beautiful thing is Jesus has paid the price for our sin. So why would we reject? Jesus says, hey, I'll take all of your sin away from you. Like all of it, all of it? Please come in. And he says, I'll, I'll, I'll forgive you. I'll give you hope and a peace in the future. Who would reject a God that loves it? We're going to learn a little more about Jesus, but who, who would reject that? Here's a quote that the rejection of Jesus in the gospel will never bring life. The rejection of Jesus in the gospel will never bring life. And many of you know exactly this because you, you lived in the world for so long. You've, you've made a bunch of money. You have houses, cars, and all of these things. And you're like, man, I, I still feel empty. I mean, I, I, I go to my bank and whoo-hoo, looks good. Go to my refrigerator, oh, that looks nice. Got my, my nice TV, got my nice house. But something in here is like, Wow. I have everything I've ever wanted, but I, I feel empty because it's Jesus. Because you can have everything and not have Jesus, and you have nothing. And you can have nothing but have Jesus and have everything. And you can be like, hey, the world is good. Jesus is good. Why is Jesus good? Listen to what we're going to learn in verse 12. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. This teaches us that Jesus sees everything. Now, you might be thinking, he sees everything, everything? Everything, everything, yes, he sees everything, everything, and he still died for our sins, right? If you and I, if, if, if we were to throw some of the everything, everything on that screen right here, we would all run out of these doors. We'd be like, huh? If you saw what the person next to you was thinking, maybe you would. <laughs> Jesus sees everything, everything, and he still chose to go to the cross for you and me. Listen to what uh, Charles Spurgeon says. It says, why are uh, his eyes like a flame of fire? Why, first to discern the secrets of all hearts. There are no secrets here that Christ does not see. There's no lewd thought. There's no unbelieving skepticism that Christ does not read. There's no hypocrisy, no formalism, no deceit that he does not scan as easily as a man reads a page in a book. His eyes are like a flame of fire to read us through and through and to know us to our inmost soul. Oh, amen. That Jesus sees past all of the, the good lookingness of all of us, right? He, he sees past the, 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 the smile and he, he, he reads and he knows what's in here and what's in here. Now, what's wonderful, family, is that he reads what's in here and here and he still says, come close. He doesn't read what's in here and in here, and he says, oh, oh, my goodness. There's, um, there's a story in the, uh, is anybody, it's a little, a little cold right now. Can you kick that off down or something? So in the, um, thank you, brother, um, uh, in the, the Gospels, there is uh, this, uh, this father, and his child is, um, is, is ill. So he comes to Jesus, and he and Jesus are talking a little bit, and Jesus says, hey, just, just believe. The father says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. So why didn't Jesus say, Psh, I'm going to need more than that. I'm going to need more than a 60-40 belief. I'm going to need more than a 70-30. Jesus said, believe. And he says, Lord, I believe, but, but, but help me in my unbelief. So help me in, in the area that I'm, I'm struggling and believing. And Jesus didn't say, well, that's not good enough. Jesus read and knew all this man was thinking, and he still invited him to walk with him. How wonderful is Jesus that he sees, he sees everything. And now, Jesus seeing everything shouldn't cause you and I to go, oh, it should say, wait a minute. He sees when I'm struggling. He sees when I'm hurting. Oh, he sees when my heart is broken. 
He's seen when I, when, when, I, when I feel crushed. Listen to Psalm 56, verse 8. It says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. And listen to this. You have recorded each one of them in your book. Anybody ever cry a little bit? <laughs> I don't know how Jesus does it, but to collect our tears in a, in a, in a little vial. And not only, not only to collect our, our tears, but then to, to write down what caused that pain. Who would say no to Jesus that, that keeps track of, of your tears? The ESV says it like this. You keep track of my tossings. You ever lay in bed? <sighs> he keeps track of, of my, my, my tossings. Let me, let, me, let me help us out a little bit. Listen to, to Psalm 139. It is just magnifique. Listen to Psalm 139. It's a Psalm of David as Jesus sees everything. David says this, Lord, you have searched me and known. It says, known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, is high, I cannot attain it. Listen to verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Well, listen to verse 13. For you formed my inward parts and you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance yet being unformed. And in your book, they were all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. Oh, and then verse 17 and 18. How precious also are your thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they are more in number than the sand. And when I awake, I am still with you. Who would say no to, uh, to Jesus that loves like this, the God that sees everything and still encourages us to, to come closer and closer to him? This is simply, simply marvelous. You guys doing all right? This is good stuff. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 12, it says, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. On his head now, it's many crowns. When he came the first time, they put a crown of thorns on his head. This time, nobody's putting a crown of thorns on his head because he is the conquering King Jesus. Amen. So he has this crown of many crowns. They're called uh, diadems. The scripture says that he had a name which no one knew except himself. In the book of Revelation, he was talking to the church at Philadelphia, and he says this in Revelation chapter 3. It says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. Listen to this. And I will write on him my new name. Isn't that exciting? Jesus, write all over me. Please. Is it just me? Jesus, write your name here, write your name here. Just write your name on my arm so I can wake up in the morning and say, I belong to Jesus. Isn't that good? Just, just knowing that we belong to Jesus, that he's going to write his name on something. What we do is when something belongs to us, we, we write our name on it, right? Was it Toy Story? You put, your, you put his name a little on the, on the boot. He said, this, 
This little person belongs to me. You and I belong to Jesus. And, and God forbid that you and I would, would, would live our lives with, with our heads down going, well, life is bad, life is tough. But then we, we need to remember that, wait a minute, I belong to Jesus. And how we need reminders from here that God sees, God knows he's coming back, but that we belong to someone. Now, earthly relationships, we belong to someone as long as that someone acts right, right? So we're, we wanna be, we're, we're married and happy until they stop acting right, until I stop feeling the way you made me feel when we first met. Now I'm somehow out of love. So my feelings for you have, have changed. Never do we read in Scripture that Jesus is going to say, you know what, I don't want you anymore. Isn't that a good thing? That, that Jesus is, no, is not going to like give up on us one day and say, well, you know what, you, you keep stumbling and falling. You, just, you can't seem to get this whole walking with me thing right. So you know what, I don't want you anymore. So followers of Jesus, we should wake up going, another day with Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're going to do something today according to your plan for my life. I would love to do a message in the, maybe in the future on, on the sovereignty of God. That big word basically means God can do whatever he wants, but he's in control of every single thing. So like today, God was in control of you making it here to church. You might say, well, you know what? Hey, I got in my car. I chose the way that I went. I, you know, chose to stop at a stop sign, possibly. <laughs> But God's plan was to, to bring you here for, 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 how many of you are new here to Calvary Chapel, Beaumont? All right. Oh, a good number of you. All right. How many of you have been here less than a year? Oh, wow. Wow. More than almost half of you. God, in his greatness, drew you here for his reason and for his purpose to hear his gospel that it might affect your life. This is the sovereignty of God. So we might say, well, I chose this. Well, God's a little bigger than you. So God in his grace and his mercy has a plan and it ha he has a purpose that he's powerful and he's strong and he invites you and I into a wonderful relationship with him. Verse 13 says, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. What does that mean? Well, some Bible scholars believe it has two meanings. One, it could be his own blood, referring to his blood shed on the cross. Others believe that it's his blood of his enemies. Isaiah 63 uh, helps us out that most likely it's the blood of his enemies. Listen to Isaiah 63. It says, who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trod in the winepress alone and from the peoples, no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury." Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. So that was Isaiah. John MacArthur says the blood splatted garment symbolizes the great battles that Jesus has uh, been in against sin, Satan, and death. And he has obviously conquered them all. Well, verse 13, it says, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, the Word of God, that's John chapter 1. In the beginning was the? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, and the Word became flesh. And what did it do? Dwelt among us. Good job, everybody, for knowing your Word. So Jesus is the Word of God. Let me give you a couple of um, uh, supporting scriptures on Jesus uh, and the Word of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, we learn that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you're new to following you, uh, some Jesus, uh, God is spirit, so he doesn't have a body like us. So God the Father is spirit. So if you ever want to know what God's like, just simply look at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 says Jesus is the express image of his person. And then Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, it says Jesus is the final and full revelation from 
God. So Jesus is the living word of God. He's the bread who came down from heaven. Thank you for being the word of God. Verse 14, it says, The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on a white horse. When was the last time you saw a huge army in white linen? When we think of a huge army, we're thinking camo gear and packs and M16s and M4s and all of these things. But this army, they're simply clothed in white linen. You want to know who's in this army? All of us. We will be coming back with Jesus. Now, what's interesting is the only one that has a, a sword or a, an instrument is Jesus. None of us will have any swords because Jesus will take care of it all. So this heavenly army, the tribulation saints, uh, saints from the church and Old Testament saints and angels. How do we know? I read to you Jude 14 and 15. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. And then in 2 Thessalonians, it says this, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. It goes on, it says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So when Jesus comes back, come back with his mighty angels and with believers from the Old Testament period and the New Testament period and definitely us, which is going to be exciting. We're going to say, we're back riding on some white horses. It says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. So Jesus has a sword. No one else has anything. So how is Jesus going to conquer everyone? The sword is also called the word of what? The word of God. So Jesus is going to defeat everybody simply by his word. Think about that. Simply by his word. How can Jesus do that? Because his word is powerful. Genesis 1, there's complete darkness and God said, hey, let there be light. And guess what had to happen? There had to be light. You remember when Jesus was, uh, was in a boat sleeping and uh, his disciples were rowing and trying to get things all working? They're like, we're going to die. Somebody wake up Jesus. I'm not waking up Jesus. You, you wake up Jesus. And somebody says, hey, Jesus, um, we're about to die. Don't you care? Jesus gets up and what does he do? He simply speaks. He says, hey, everybody, just shh. Wind and waves, peace be still. And what happens? It, the wind and waves had to say, yes, sir, peace be still. So he spoke. And the wind and the waves obeyed him. Remember, he went to the tomb of Lazarus. Everybody's gathered around, and Jesus didn't say, oh, we have a big crowd here, Father, so I uh, hope, hope something's going to work. No. Jesus said, hey, remove the stone. And the Bible says in the King James that by now, Lord, he stinketh. He's been in there for a long time. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Move the stone. Jesus had a simple prayer and he says, hey, Lazarus, come on. Yes, master. Lazarus came out. Jesus said, hey, unloose him. So in each of these instances, Jesus simply spoke a word and something happened. Why? Because he is the word of God. He's the almighty God. So what if it's darkness and Jesus says, hey, let there be light. There has to be light. So following that same thought, when Jesus says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. When Jesus says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. That's why when if somebody's ill, we lay hands on them. We don't say in the name of Henry or in the name of John or in the name of Sal. No, we say in the name of, of Jesus. In the name of the one who spoke and the universe leapt into existence. That's why, family, you and I need to, we need to stay in this. If we don't stay in this and we just keep looking at that, we're going to wake up, okay, how much fear can I swallow today? You know, uh, how much, you know, uh, what else is going on in our world? I, I, we look around and let me just keep watching all of this disaster, all of these arguments and all these fightings. Ooh, today's going to be a horrible day. But if we 
stay in our word, and we're like, oh, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is going to work everything out. And until he comes back, we have something to do. So since we have something to do, we should wake up saying, Lord, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do today? Uh, how are you going to use me today? I um, go hiking with, uh, with some folks on, uh, on Fridays mostly, and um, my, my prayer is, 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 is Jesus, give me an open door to, to talk uh, about your gospel, because we go on a little ways. And uh, this Friday, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, immigration, and uh, this gentleman turned and he says, do you believe that? And uh, I said, you know what? I believe if we love Jesus according to what the Bible says, the world will be a better place. He turned around and he says, I can get behind something like that. And gave me a high five. Invited him to church. He's not here, but one day he's going to be here. But my point is that Jesus, uh, just give us an open door to talk about the greatness of, of you, about, about the gospel. Why? Because Jesus is this word of God. And if we, if we don't find hope in God's word, where else are we going to go? Where else can you and I turn to, to to find hope? You know, we can turn to alcohol. Okay, you got to keep coming back and back and back and back. Hey, maybe it's drugs. You get keep going back and back and again. Or relationships. So well, I got to find this one. Well, that didn't work. Let me find another one. Just It's just, it's all endless. But we turn to the scriptures and we find, we find hope. We find that Jesus is more than enough for you and I. And my hopes are that your search, that your search is over. If you're searching for, for something, if you're searching for love, Read Psalm 139 again when you go home. That's, that's great love. To know everything about us and still invite us to come closer is simply beautiful. So Jesus is going to strike all the nations with simply the word of his mouth. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, it says, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with what? The breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Simply speaking, and the battle is over. So the battle of Armageddon is not really a battle. <laughs> Jesus pretty much speaks, and it's all over. And we'll learn about that in the next week or two. It also says, oh, listen to what Jeff Lassane says. Then Jesus, when Jesus returns, he will destroy his enemies, not by fighting against them, but by merely speaking the words of judgment against them. Simply speaking his word. It says that he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. So when Jesus returns... Everything will come under his kingdom. He will establish what's called a theocracy underneath him. And that basically means, it doesn't mean the uh, leveling of existing governments with a Christian principles. And if I could also say something on that, that effect, oh, Jesus help me. Um, our mandate is the gospel. That's, that's, that, that's our mandate. So we're, we're not to create a Christian utopia uh, here on, on planet Earth. Uh, we're here to, to preach the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. That, uh, so let's say everything is Christian, Christianized, right? Okay, what now? This is not heaven. This, 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 is, this is Earth. So we're, we're here to, to, give, to give the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we're like, well, well let's make everything Christian. Well, let's make everything about Jesus right? Let's just make everything uh, about Jesus. So this theocracy, it's um, not leveling uh, existing governments with Christian principles, the spiritual conversion of countries or empires, leaving them in existence and simply Christianizing them so as to exhibit something of Christ's spirit in their administrations, but the total displacement of all the world's sovereigns and governments and taking all of all dominion and authority out of their hands and putting it into the hands of Christ. This is what Christ will do. Well, lastly, it says, and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. If you haven't been with us, we have the wine press, uh, we uh, basically you have this big vat and you have grapes in it and then you step on it. Those of you who are old enough, you remember I Love Lucy? Yeah. Remember, so she's in, the, in there and she's just stepping, crushing grapes. So that's a wine press of, of, of crushing, uh, crushing grapes. So the wine press was normally set above uh, higher. So as you crush the grapes, the wine would, would then flow down into a vat. Um, a lower vat. So this is picturing what's going to happen uh, with Israel in the sense that God is going to um, put uh, unbelievers, if you can say that, in a wine press. We can say it like this. All Israel will become a giant wine press 
with the valley of Megiddo becoming the main upper vat and the blood flowing down through the land. Jesus himself will tread the wine press. So if you are not a follower of Jesus, this is the future of those who aren't followers of Jesus. Listen how our text ends. And he had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's beautiful. Why is that beautiful? There's nothing higher than King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> Nothing else is coming after that. King of kings and, and Lord of lords. Now, family, think about this. There is no one greater. There's no one greater than Jesus. We're going to go outside and, and the sun, as powerful and huge as it is, we know the one who made it. Even better yet, the one who made it knows you and I. He's king of kings and lord of lords. That Jesus doesn't have to go to somebody and say, okay, well, Calvary Chapel, Beaumont, they're praying about a bunch of stuff, and I'm not sure what to do. Jesus has nobody to ask. He doesn't have to ask for wisdom or for power or strength because there's no one greater than him. So since that's the fact, family, there's no one greater than Jesus. How has that affected your life? How has it affected your life that there's no one greater than Jesus and Jesus invites you to come follow him? The creator of all says, you come follow me and I will give you all that you need to follow me. Do you read this and go, man, I want to do that. Man, Lord, here I am, send me, Lord. I know there's a mountain before us, but your word says we can, we can move mountains. Your word says this by a little mustard seed of faith. Now, is, 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 is the faith in the mustard seed family? No, the faith is in the one that said this is all that he, he requires. God's not saying, you know, give me all of this. He just says, hey, just buy a small little mustard, mustard seed. The King of kings and Lord of lords says, come follow me. And the, the requisite is simply believe. Simply believe. We're thinking, that's all? That's it? Yeah. Simply believe. Just follow Jesus to the best of your ability and, and simply believe. Because for us to read this and go, well, that was just for them. How sad would that be? That, that we should read this and say, Lord, I want to be like Peter. I want to be in a boat with 11 of my, my, my other brothers and see you and say, Jesus, I know this might sound really stupid, but can I come out on the water? I know it may sound like it's impossible, but Jesus, can I come out? Now, now why is that crazy? King of kings, Lord of lords, can we ever ask anything of Jesus? And he'll say, hmm, I don't know. Let me get back to you. And Peter said, Lord, it's a storm going on. It's dark. But can I come out? I mean, who asked that, right? Because it doesn't make any sense. The, 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 most sense it makes, the, the most safe place is to be in a boat. But Peter said the safest place to be was on the water with Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Peter, you're stupid. No one can walk on water. Stop talking so much. Jesus says, come on. If you want to come out, come out of the boat. And I wonder how many of us would say, this is going to end out bad for Peter. <laughs> or if we would have said, hey, Jesus, I, I want to come too. And my point in saying all this, family, since Jesus is Lord of Lords, what can't we do in his name? Since there is no one greater than him, what can't? the church do in his name. That's why here at CCB, we, Lord, if you bring it to us, if, if we have some kind of uh, desire to do something, stuff like, hey, Lord, help us to give teddy bears to everyone in two convalescent homes. Lord, help us to, to find 600 teddy bears. Lord, help us to, to, to once in a while feed the community. Lord, help us to give Christmas gifts to, to whomever. And we're like, well, hope there's enough in the truck. <laughs> we're like, I don't know. But Lord, what can't we do? Just little old Calvary Chapel moment. Maybe Jesus is saying, 
Just whoever responds to these little mustard seeds, this is all that you require, just to, to do great things for the kingdom of God. And, and I don't mean great things by like this, but why not great things just be entrusting in Jesus? Just trusting in Jesus for these, for these, 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 these little things. Because he's, he's king of kings and lord of lords. And I, and I hope the Holy Spirit will, will help make sense of what, of what I'm saying. That once you and I grab a hold that there's no one greater than Jesus, and as we keep reading our words, reading, reading his word, it should, it should transform our lives to where we're like, man, God can do this. Can we pray real quick? Uh, if you're going through a little something, something, and it may seem to you um, like it's not going to happen. It may seem to you like it's an impossibility. We're reading that he's king of kings and lord of lords. So let's just take our little mustard seed, right? Let's just take it and say, Jesus, the thing I'm facing is greater than I. But here's my mustard seed. Let's just lay it before the Lord, right? Because he's king of kings and lord of lords. There's no one greater that we can bring our need to besides Jesus. So uh, let me tell you this before we go too far. Um, so no matter how long something has been going on, no matter how difficult it's been, let's just simply take your mustard seed of faith and say, Jesus, here I am. It's 1114. Here it is. I'm bringing it to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Lord, you have your way with it because in your hands is the greatest hands it could ever be in.